All right. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Megan Masterson, and I am the manager of alumni career programs over at the Alumni Association, and I'm part of the lead for the Young Alumni Conference, which this is a lead up event for. So I'm so thrilled y'all are here, and I'm even more excited to talk with Alejandra today. We have a lot of information to cover, but we're going to take questions at the end of the webinar. So I'll be keeping track of the chat. So just feel free to submit any questions there using the chat function and I'll make sure to hold them and you know we can we can follow them at the end. Like I said earlier, we are recording. So a recording and slides from today's webinar will be available and shared with you following today's sessions. And you can utilize closed captioning if you need by clicking the CC button on your Zoom panel. And so our guest speaker today, Alejandra, is the founder of Empower Her Change and co-founder of Opti Wellbeing Solutions. At 19 years old, she felt sick to her stomach as she negotiated her salary. I did as well. <laughs> and was thrilled when she successfully negotiated an increase of $2,500. Now as a career coach, she helps her clients increase their salaries by anywhere from $10,000 to $38,000. She kept seeing all her clients come in with familiar, similar fears and making the same mistakes. And so her approach in coaching is to reflect the famous quote, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. She basically teaches her clients how to fish, so she says, so that they can continue to multiply their income in the years to come. Her coaching focuses on helping her clients rebuild confidence, get clear about their life and career goals, and overcome imposter syndrome so that they can lead a fulfilling life. She intersects her passion for career coaching, leadership development, and health to bring a holistic approach to helping people thrive in the workplace. Alejandra, I already said this, but I'm so looking forward to your presentation today, and I'll let you take it away when you're ready. Lovely. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to talk about salary negotiation, something I feel passionate about. And thank you, Megan, for the introduction. I'm going to do just a very brief intro on, you know, just who I am on a personal level outside of career coaching. But for the agenda today, what we're going to do is really talk about, again, who am I? Why even listen to me? And then also, how do you prep? How do you prep for salary negotiation? And then how do you execute on salary negotiation? Prepping is the biggest part that I find a lot of my clients struggle with. And so I'm going to spend a good amount of this presentation talking about how do you prep and having you walk away with tangible tools on how to prep for your next salary negotiation. Now, a little bit more in terms of like, who am I on a personal level? I am Alejandra Hernandez. I'm a career and leadership coach, and I am a first-generation Latina. My parents immigrated from Colombia. And as you can see over here, this is me participating in some casual child labor in rural Colombia, where my aunt has a farm. And I wound up stumbling for many years after I graduated. I graduated at the, from the University of Maryland in 2014 and stumbled for a very long time, going from one career path to another career path to moving cities and all these different things. And then landed in career coaching, which really felt so aligned and like my calling. So since then, I've been coaching primarily first gen and women of color to develop themselves professionally, lead themselves and able to get promoted, make more money and feel more confident at work. So as we really get started, what I want to hear from you, I really want to understand and where you're at, what are your biggest fears about negotiating your salary? I want you to drop it in the chat. What is the biggest fear that comes up for you when it comes to negotiating your salary? Because that gives me, I'll kind of hold off as people put in the chat, but that gives me an idea of what are the biggest things that are blocking you from making more money, that are blocking you from feeling more confident about the work that you do and about how you make more money in the future or have these kind of difficult conversations that some people can have. Okay, SW, that's all I see. So apologies, but feeling greedy, okay. Common one that I find, feeling greedy, rejection, absolutely what to say, getting the conversation started with your supervisor. Okay. All right, Peter, that's really great to know asking for too little, but then also asking for too much, right? It's like, is it too much? Is it too little? I don't know how I get it right. And then if you struggle with perfectionism, it's game over from there. So trying to find the right target employer, not being receptive. If it's not accepted, I would feel like I'm undervalued and not as motivated. So the fear of what would happen if they say no to your career path as you feel less motivated, finding the right spot. 
Okay. So we have a few that are like, how do I find the right spot, the right number, the right target, creating tension, fear about creating tension. Okay. These are really good for me to see. I'm kind of reading over them again, rejection. Okay. So we're going to address some of these here, the big ones. And I like to ask this because one of the most common things that I see, and again, I work primarily with first-gen women of color. So as first-gen, a lot of times we really don't have the access to the kind of information that people who maybe have had parents that already climbed the corporate ladder may have. And so a lot of times it's that fear of like, am I doing it right? I don't know how to do it right. How do I even start the conversation? And then women, women of color in particular, I find it's like fear of what if they say no, what if I'm being greedy and so forth. So some of the biggest lies that I really see because our brain tells us a lot of lies and it can kind of be dramatic and it tells us lies, especially if we're doing something that is going to be very uncomfortable for us. And so here, are just a few lies that I see very often in my coaching. It's what if they rescind the offer? There's a fear of like, what happens if they rescind the offer? I'll be asking for too much, which I know someone wound up saying in here, um, Alexandra, I believe asking for little or too much, um, but it's a nonprofit. That's another one. Like, especially if you feel like you shouldn't be asking for more money because it's for like a social cause, I should just like do it because I feel passionate about this work but this is what I love to do. So I shouldn't have to ask for more and they should see how much work I'm putting in. So they should offer me a raise. So there's all these different lies that our brain can kind of give us that make it difficult for us to negotiate our salary and stop us from doing that. So I want to address some of these as we move forward. And I can see some of these that came up in the chat. Now, in reference to what Peter said, one of the things I actually remembered about that comment is I am going to reference bits about if you're negotiating your salary at your current company, but I'm also going to address primarily on like, if you're negotiating your salary at a new company. So there's going to be slight differences, but there's still, it's still most of the same things, but there's going to be slight differences when it comes to asking for a raise at your current place versus asking for uh, like negotiating your salary at a new job. Okay. Now negotiation is an art this really is something like there's a reason why it's uncomfortable. All right. There's an art to this. And there's two aspects that I think are so important to really understand. And that's the strategic and the psychological. Oftentimes as people in this world where we like emphasize so much on strategy and like what's our pros and our cons and all these different things, we tend to lean towards strategy without actually taking into account the kind of mindset that we're going to need to succeed in this. So I encourage you to really look into how can I tactically prepare, but also fortify my mindset to handle a rejection because they could reject the offer. How do I fortify my mindset to handle that emotion that comes up of feeling icky because I think I'm feeling greedy the way SW said in terms of their fear. The mindset piece is so important because you're going to see in the chat as people put their biggest fear if some of this is rooted in the mindset and how you perceive and what you perceive could happen as opposed to what has happened. Now, some of the mistakes that people make when it comes to negotiating their salary is not asking at all, which is um, quite common that I find for people that don't even know negotiating your salary is a thing um, or are too afraid. Lack of preparation. So sometimes this happens because someone, it's not necessarily because someone's just nonchalant and doesn't care, but sometimes lack of preparation happens because of lack of knowledge of how to prepare or just fear. Like there's so much fear around how to prepare that you don't prepare and maybe it just spills out and you just ask for the raise without the preparation. Preparation starts late is number three. And I'm going to talk about how that's a big problem and the step one into preparing for your negotiation and then focusing on tactics without the mindset I just touched on. And then the last one, no clarity on your request. I believe it's Brene Brown that says clear is kind. And we want to use that in negotiation as well. Clarity is imperative that you are clear, not like more, but like how, what specifically are you requesting? Okay. Now that we've covered some lies, some mistakes that people make, let's go into step one of how do you know on terms of where do you start to prepare? Step one being know your timeline. One of the mistakes that I just mentioned is not knowing your timeline, preparing too late. This is a huge mistake in misunderstanding when you need to start preparing for your salary negotiation because you do not want to end up like this person right here who gets the call and then is asked the question, 
what's your salary requirement? And now you're fumbling, you're nervous, you're like, I have no idea, just say a number and you say a number. This is such a crappy situation to be in, y'all, because the moment the recruiter asks what your salary range is, is the moment that you have the opportunity to either completely, I would say, just diminish your ability to negotiate your salary or accelerate and enhance your ability to, to negotiate your salary. So I've seen this really, really ruin someone's ability because they set a number and then they realized it was too low after, and then they offered them that number. And now it's like, well, you said that number and they're giving you what you wanted, right? So it's so important that you know your timeline. Now, what is your timeline? If you are someone who's looking for a new job right now and is looking, just applying to jobs, you're looking to switch jobs, your timeline is now. It starts now as you are applying to jobs. And the reason, and this is a, a, that's so important. If you are currently applying to jobs, please have clarity on what target you have for your job. If you do not have clarity in what job, if you're the kind that's just like, I just hate it here. I just need to get out of here. I'll take whatever. I'm looking for anything. That is going to be a very messy process because how are you going to prepare in the other steps I have for you and market research and all these different ways if you don't have a really refined target of what you're looking for? So it's so important that as you are, if you are applying to jobs, that you have clarity on what job are you targeting so that you can do all the research, you can do all the strategy for that job and be prepared in the way that you need to be prepared to set yourself up for success. So if you're looking for a job and you want to negotiate your salary as you are looking for a job, it starts now. And it starts with clarity on what job it is that you're targeting. And if I think Peter may have mentioned, I know there's some people here that talked about like, how do you get the conversation started with the supervisor or Carolyn um, said, creating tension between my boss and me. So if you are looking for a raise in your current job, if this is a promotion or a raise, then what you want to do is create a six month gate plan. So super important. You need to give yourself a roadway. You need to be able to give yourself time to get everything together. If you're in your current job, be able to showcase why your value has increased in the workplace specifically for the raise. If you want to ask for a raise or if you know that your, your annual review is coming up and it's like next month, you're cutting yourself short in how much time you have to prepare for this. All right. Now, one of the examples that I wanted to give here is my client, Laura, she went from making 45K as a nutrition educator, working in a government funded program to 70K as a farm manager. And as we, and she actually landed this job in April of 2020 in the midst as people were canceling interviews on her, as people were going on hiring freezes, like all these different things. But in order for us to be able to do this, we had to get clear on her timeline. We had to get clear on how long she was willing to stay at her job if she was able to financially support herself if she didn't have a job and why the salary increase was important for her. And we had to get clear on what she was targeting in order to be able to prepare for what kind of salary she would negotiate. The last thing I want to give about this example is I know um, this is for early career, but I changed career paths like two years into my career. So you could still be changing career paths. And I just want to offer that if you ever get the inkling that changing career paths means you're starting over, that it's really, really not true. I work with career changers all the time. And nine out of, time, ten out of 10, they're making more money at their next career because everything you do now is preparing you for the next one. Everything you do now is a part of the skill set that you will present to your employer or potential employer for that salary increase that you're looking for. So step one, know your timeline. Don't get caught preparing late. Step two, market research. So some of you may have heard about this if you've Googled even just a little bit about salary negotiation. So I'm going to talk about the common sites that you can use for market research and the last one that I find to be the most effective, but yet maybe the most uncomfortable for people to do. With market research, there are a variety of websites that you can review to do this, to look at different salaries. You can use Glassdoor, you can use salary.com, you can use Payscale. And when you do these, one of the biggest things is understanding different variables. And as you go through these three websites, 
I want, this is always so important to first just get a general sense of what's paying for the role that you're targeting, which is why going back to what I just said, you not, you have to know what you're targeting in order for you to be able to negotiate your salary and prepare appropriately. The last one I'm going to talk about, because it's really one that is super juicy, but again, it can be really uncomfortable, but yields the best results and feeling confident and comfortable when you are asking for that salary. So before we get into that, let's talk about the variables. When you're looking at internet sites and you're looking at different salaries, you want to make sure that you're taking into account these variables like the job title, like location, experience, education, industry. A nonprofit will generally pay less than the private sector. Generally speaking, though, a nonprofit will also have better benefits, usually. Not always, but usually you'll find better benefits at nonprofit because it's kind of their way of like, making up for the lower salary, they'll give you really good benefits. So understanding those, if you're trying to compare, you know, a product manager in the nonprofit sector to the product manager in the private sector, you're, go you're comparing apples to oranges and you want to get as close as possible from apples to apples. Megan, I think we have someone off mute. If you could check that, that'd be great. And then from there, you also location. Like a job in the rural Midwest might be different. I mean, will actually be different than a major U.S. city. So you want to make sure you're getting close to apples to apples to ensure that you're getting numbers that are as accurate as possible of what you could find online. Now, as you go on these, understand you might find a lot of variety. So if you are looking for a role and maybe it's more of, um, I don't like the word generic, but I would say more common, a more common title like account executive that's gonna give you such a vast salary range. And so you wanna try to look as like kind of nitpick and just go through like an account executive with this amount of uh, years of experience in this industry because it's gonna you know, make a difference in this location. You wanna make sure you're looking at all these things. And then the last thing I'll say is about this, when you're looking at different websites, this is important for you to really take down. If you're looking at different websites and you're seeing, okay, but Glassdoor is saying 72K. And then salary.com is saying 63K. And then this one is saying 65K. And then it feels like, oh my gosh, what is it? Just do some math, just take all of them and then average them out and use that as an average. As long as you were doing your best to do apples to apples, job title, location, education, experience, industry, those things, take the average of what you find in different websites. That number is going to be really, really important for you as you move on into the next step. When I talk about these variables, one of the things with my client Jade is she went from making 50K as a social worker to 67K as a training manager at a nonprofit. And one of her problems was that she was going laterally, meaning she kept moving from one job to the other to the other, but she wasn't making any more money because she was just taking, she was going on a flat line. She wasn't trying to get really promoted because there were some blocks there about like her confidence and things like that. So we finally moved up by looking at her skill set, by looking at what she had to offer. And then once it came to the kind of salary she wanted, we had to then look at the variables for the salary. So we knew that she was going to work at a nonprofit. So we knew that that was going to be, you know, lower than if she were to be a training manager at a for-profit. So this is what I mean, getting this kind of clarity is so important because now she was able to raise her income by 17K by being able to look at different industries and target where she wanted to work and align her values with a nonprofit that she really enjoyed. And again, showcasing just because you're switching careers doesn't mean that you have to start all over. She was able to use a lot of what she did as a social worker and before that to be able to negotiate her salary and say, hey, these are all the things that I offer. I may not have been a training manager before, but these are the things that I have to offer. Now, the last piece, when you look at these websites, and then you have a number that you've averaged out, this is the one that can be scary for people, but is the most fruitful. And that's having conversations with people, with real humans and actually talking about salaries. Gen Z, I feel like are just pushing this concept and I love it of transparency, of pay transparency. I have seen over and over again, y'all are just kind of like, cracking it open and you're like, we, what are you getting paid and what are you getting paid? And we deserve to know. And now we're beginning to see some of that show up in the job world where people are posting more jobs with salaries on them, which I love as a career coach, hundred percent SW, we've got to normalize it for sure. 
And it is so helpful, not only for, you know, everyone here to really understand these salary ranges, but also to be able to close the gap that happens because of biases, the gap between different people who hold different marginalized identities. And so I really love that Gen Z's kind of blown this open. And when I talk about these conversations, you again, you want to find as much as you can apples to apples. So you maybe want to find someone who just had the role that you had that you're looking for, or is currently in the role that you're looking for. And so primarily, if you look, if you're talking to someone and they were a project project manager, whatever it may be at a certain place, and they were a project manager a couple of years ago, but now they've been promoted, you can ask them about their previous experience and things like that. So while conversations about salaries can be uncomfortable for some, many will be open to sharing. Many will be open to sharing at least some aspects. They may not be comfortable telling you the exact number. Most of them will be comfortable at least sharing a range. And sometimes people are uncomfortable sharing the number and it's not necessarily because like, I don't want you to know the number. It's just because it's taboo. It's just because it's different. It's not something we say very often. It's not something we ask very often. So if people ask and get asked that question, sometimes it's not like you're making them uncomfortable and you're asking them something bad. It's just, it's boring. It's like a new thing. So they're like, oh, okay. But a lot of times people are open to sharing. So how do you go about this? There's three different methods that I kind of talk about for this conversation about talking salaries. And that's the over under, that's the in between, and that's the your guess. So let's say you have a conversation with someone and you know you talk to them and you're talking, oh, someone put it in there, thank you. And so you're talking to them, there's three different methods. There's the over under, which is where you shoot the number that you got from doing market research. So again, this is not replacing the market research in terms of looking on the websites. This is just adding a layer to it. So you take that number and from the number that you got and you averaged out, you would say, hey, based on da 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 da, do you earn over or under this amount? And then that's one method. The next method is in between. You can ask them, like, do you land somewhere in between this and this? And remember, you um, want to try to keep that range narrow. You know, you don't want to say, like, from 100 to 150, because that doesn't really help you when you want to negotiate your salary. So you want to try to keep that range small. And then the your guess method. So I'm thinking of pitching blank. Does that sound fair according to your experience? Those, these are three different methods that you can use. And I'm going to give you a script on the next one. And you can screenshot this if you want to screenshot it and have it for yourself. But here's just an example of what it could look like for you. It could look like, hey, person's name, I'm going for a promotion similar to yours and preparing for my interview in the interest of salary transparency. I wanted to ask what salary you earned when you first started this role. I want to make sure I'm matching my experience with the correct rate. If you're not comfortable with the exact number, I understand and would greatly appreciate a range too. Does blank to blank sound fair? This is a way for you to ask someone and for them, one, to always remember, you want to be able to, this is, this is their personal information. So they have every right to say, like, I don't want to talk about that, which is why you say, like, if you're not comfortable, I totally understand. Does this to this sound fair? And now you're giving yourself the ability to have market research that is unlike anything else because it's, you're actually talking to people who are in that role. Again, you want to take into account industry and things like that. That is a gold mine when it comes to negotiating your salary, especially I've had certain clients who talk to people that are within the company that they're targeting and they were, they were able to talk to someone there and they were open to talking to them about it. So that makes a huge, huge difference. As you go through those different methods and you get all this feedback, just take notes. Make sure you're keeping track of all these things. Don't try to remember everything in your brain. And then the final thing you want to do is you want to decide on your salary number and be like decide actually comes from the root word to kill off. And it's literally to just you're ending all other options. And I want you to really look at it that way. Like this is the salary. This is the non-negotiable, the minimum I am willing to take. And it's based on the market research that I did, not only looking online, but also having conversations with people. Decide on that salary so that you can be grounded in that number and know when it's time to negotiate. This is critical. Now, the next step after market research is you're going to look beyond the salary and prioritize. 
I think salary is the one that everyone focuses on. And I think it's fine. Like looking at your salary, it makes a big difference, like how much you make, but salary negotiation actually is a little, it's ironic because there's actually a lot more than the salary that can be negotiated. Compensation goes way beyond the salary. So it's important to understand the other aspects so that you can just understand what's important for me. And is there something else that I want to negotiate for myself? And sometimes that's true for people, depending on where they are in their life. Like some people who are maybe in their older years, 401k and health insurance is really, really important to them. And they're willing to sacrifice a little bit on something else if they have really good benefits there. So that's just an example. And looking at the different things that go in a compensation package, we're looking at salary bonuses, PTO, insurance, 401k, flex hours? Is it a hybrid environment? Is there child care? Is there, are they going to provide me? This is a big one actually, um, as well for a lot of my clients is they want to feel like th the company's investing in their growth. And so if they have a company where they're subsidizing some of their professional development, maybe they, they give them a stipend for that, um, a stipend for remote work, like so many different aspects. So when you look at this, I think this is another one that you want to screenshot and just take a look at this so that you can really look into what are the most important aspects for me and see these other things as money, like 401k, if they have a 5% match at a 401k, that's literally money. They're giving you money. It's in your 401k and you will get it later, but it's, they're giving you money. So there's certain things that really do they're, they're not money and like, this is the money I give to you right now, but it still counts as money in a way like medical insurance. If they're going to charge you so much more, that's taking away from your salary than another company who might charge less. So look at these and prioritize really important that you actually come in because the other thing, as we talk late, as we go into it later is this gives you more, more ways and more variety on how to negotiate your salary. If the salary itself is non-negotiable. And that happens sometimes. There's some companies that really, they don't have wiggle room in negotiating the salary component, but they might have wiggle room. Oftentimes they do in other aspects. So you want to be able to have a clear picture of all the things so that you can know what's the most important aspect for me and how do I prioritize it? This was an example for my client, Paula, who went went from making 104k to 148k at the same company so this was switching roles at the same company and negotiating her offer a lot and some of it actually came in through the bonus it came in through the bonus through a year end bonus that she gets because of being in this level of the role cuz she did get a, she went up in title and they get a different bonus package at the end of the year and so we looked at that and we really began to see like okay yeah, it might not be in this flat out right here, but at the end of the year, you will hit 148K. And her goal, when she thought about 150, it wasn't her non-negotiable. 150 was not her non-negotiable. It was like her dream. Like she was like, I would love to make. And we got to 148 by simply being able to look at the different aspects of the compensation package and deciding what is the most important and what are you willing to take? So this is really, really helpful for you to build clarity around the different aspects of compensation and what's important for you right now. Step four is know exactly what you bring to the table. This is such a big one. I am the queen of clarity in your career. I absolutely feel like it all starts with clarity. If you do not know where you're going, how do you know you're on target? I am a firm believer that clarity builds confidence. As you begin to feel clear about what you're targeting, what you bring to the table, you know, the years of experience, all these different things, it builds confidence because you know in your mind the things that you bring to the table. So the way that I like to do this is I have this chart and this, can, you know, just I just put this in here again. You can take um, a screenshot of this or just kind of write it down in your journal, however you would like. But looking at your qualifications to the job posting itself. So here I created the three different columns where it's like the job description states this. I am going to write whether I don't meet it, whether I meet it, or whether I exceed it. And then you can add in some notes on the third column. And I just want to say a side note that if you are changing careers, you don't have to meet every single qualification. 
trust me, I've had many of my clients switch careers where they didn't meet the job description to the T. This is simply a way for you to begin to see where are you getting, like, what are you bringing to the table, the skills that they're looking for and how you meet them. Okay. So if they say five years of experience and you meet that great, if they say a bachelor's degree and you have a master's degree, then you exceed that. And this is a very simple snapshot way of being able to look at where can I negotiate a bit more and how, what am I leveraging? How am I leveraging negotiating more because of these things? So again, familiar with Salesforce, exceed, train new employees on Salesforce. And the other thing I want to say here is if in a job description, they have preferably, like this is a cherry on top that I automatically tell my clients, you are exceeding them because it is why the way they said it is they prefer. So we would, we would be, we would love if you did have that, but you don't have to. So if you do have that, I see that as you are exceeding the qualifications you are going over because that is what they prefer to have. So remember that too, like if you're looking at the preferred and you're like, oh, I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have that. It's okay. I still encourage a lot of times my clients to apply if they have the appropriate skill set that is needed in that role, even if you don't meet the preferred qualifications. And on the other side, there's people that have the preferred qualifications and I'm like, go off. That's cherry on top. Use that when you're negotiating your salary. So these are the major things when it comes to preparing for your salary negotiation. Remember, you wanna know your timeline. You wanna do market research by looking at those websites and having conversations with people. You want to look beyond the salary and prioritize. And then you wanna make sure you know what you're bringing to the table. Go through your work history. What have you accomplished? If you're feeling very unstable and insecure, or just like, you know, oh, I'm not really sure. Like, do I have enough experience? I don't really know. Am I qualified? You want to address those ASAP because that goes back to the mindset. It's so important that you have clarity on what you bring to the table, the things you've accomplished, even if it's a career change. Now, during the negotiation itself, one of the quotes that I have for myself and for my clients is negotiating is uncomfortable in the short term in exchange for a comfortable gain in the long term. And I invite you to really think about it in that way because I'm uncomfortable when I negotiate. It's not that this discomfort just goes away. The level of discomfort definitely goes away. I don't feel sick to my stomach like I did when I was 19. And you know, if for me, it's the discomfort doesn't dissipate but I understand that there is discomfort and it's only for the short term because what I get out of this will be much better in the long term, will be much better for me in the long term. So I invite you to kind of take that with you if it is something that feels really scary for you. Now, when negotiating the offer itself, let's say you get the call and they're offering you something, I always tell my clients ahead of time, Never say that you accept an offer as soon as they offer it to you on the phone or whatever it may be. Never say yes immediately. As soon as you say yes, negotiation's done. It's out the door. You've agreed to the terms. So always, whenever you get an offer, celebrate because you're awesome and they think you're awesome and they think you have something to offer to this company. So celebrate and say, thank you so much. I can't wait to see the offer. Please send it over to me. I'll make sure to get back to you by and give yourself at least, you know, two days. Is that okay? If it's Monday, I'll make sure I get back to you by Thursday, 10 a.m. Is that okay? Never immediately say yes, no matter how excited you are, because there's always room to always just evaluate, look at it, even if it's your dream job. It's not like you're saying no, you're just giving yourself the space to look at what they're offering you. So step one, review and decide on your counter. Now, your counter offer. So as you get this, you want to compare your salary to your non-negotiable salary. Is it higher? Is it on target? Is it lower? Just look at that and make sure, okay, where am I? If the salary is on target, do you want to negotiate more on the salary or do you want to negotiate other parts of the package? Remember, that's why it's looking at the other parts is important. Let's say they, you said, I would love to have 90K 
and then they gave you 90K, it doesn't mean that you can't negotiate, but maybe you don't negotiate the salary. Maybe you negotiate another part because they did give you what it is that you requested. So take a look. There's so many nuances in salary negotiations. So I just want to give you general rule of thumbs because there's always going to be nuances in negotiating your salary. Now, if there are skills that you want to highlight, like what are they and how do you want to bring that up when negotiating a higher salary? So if let's say they offered you 80K and what you asked was 90K, you can then decide for yourself. Remember now you've given yourself some space. Go back to that chart that you created where you've talked about all the ways that you meet and all the way that you exceed and which ones are the ones that you want to highlight. Because by the time an offer has been made, just a side note, by the time hiring is actually, I don't know, because you're like early career, maybe hiring is really frustrating sometimes for companies. And by the time they find someone, it's like one of those things where it's like, we just, we want this person. You have a lot of leverage because they've decided that they would like to hire you. They've gone through the whole process. Like I know for you, it's also exhausting to go through the interviews, but trust me, there's an HR manager who just wants to get this filled and find the appropriate person. So you have leverage in this a hundred percent you do. So look at the skills that you want to highlight in order to advocate for a higher salary because they have chosen you for a reason. Now, the other thing is the mindset piece, really think back and consider why do you deserve the salary you are asking for? And I actually want to deconstruct this. This is a side note, just on my own tangent, be careful with tying your worth with how much you get paid. And by be careful, I mean, really try to refrain from it because that's where things get real slippery. And that's where that fear of rejection becomes so raw because rejection actually means I am not worthy. When you begin to tie your worth with your work, negotiating your salary is very emotionally charged. And when generally speaking, when our emotions are really high, our intelligence is not so high, it's pretty low. So we want to give ourselves the space to feel whatever we want to feel and come up with a plan to share what our counter is and ground yourself in. Why do you deserve that salary? Not because you are worthy as a person, you are worthy as a person, no matter what, but why do you deserve that salary for this role? What's the skills that you're bringing in? What's even the personality aspects that you're bringing in? Like, what do you bring in the vision, the mindset that you're bringing in to a workplace? You want to really go into that. Now, crafting out your counter offer, what is it that you're going to share with the HR, with the people? Step two, counter and use the gratitude sandwich. So I like to use the analogy of a gratitude sandwich because it means exactly the way it can sound. You want to start off with expressing gratitude. You want to bring up your skills, qualifications, and market research and make your clear request, meaning X amount of dollars, X amount of additional PTO, like specific requests of what you, are, what you desire to have adjusted to your compensation package. And then you want to end with gratitude. So you start with those two things there. And this is an example, if you want to screenshot this, you're more than welcome to screenshot this. This is just an example that I've given um, someone else, like a former client of mine who is in the HR space. So as you can see, we have gratitude up here. Thank you. And this is also expressing like, I want this job. I'm just saying there's some things I want to work out, but I do want this job. And then secondly, you want to talk about your experience here. So given seven plus years, throw in some stats, things like that. I find that people in their early career sometimes are feeling a little bit insecure because they don't know, they don't think they've done as much since they haven't been working for five, seven, 10, whatever amount of years. Trust there's things that you've already accomplished. So you just want to begin to highlight those here. There are things that you've accomplished. There are things that you can add in. And then at the end, again, gratitude. Again, I believe that this is a great company for me. I would be a lovely asset to the team. Should you accept my proposal? I love this too, because it's like, if you accept this, I'm down. Like I'm ready to go, but there's just some things that I want to get adjusted. So this, you can take a screenshot of and practice. Now, what if they say no? The fear of rejection, that like, ugh, the thing that happens in the body when it's just like, oh no. So if they say no, one of the things that I always want to start off with my clients is get yourself recalibrated back to a regulated state, especially if you have a lot of fears. So one of the things that I um, just like as a tip for you is 
just practice imagining the scenario where they do say no so that it doesn't feel as much of a shock and a fear when they do say no. So for me as an entrepreneur, I like to go into things and sometimes I play with the idea of like just expecting that they'll say no whenever I'm going to pitch something. That way when they do, I'm not like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I can just manage, begin to manage myself and be like, okay, I went through this scenario. So what would it look like from here? So breathe, get yourself back into a regulated state because when we are in fight or flight, we don't make very smart decisions. It's just now we're just in complete survival mode, even though the body doesn't actually know we're technically safe, we're in our home, in AC, in we have food, but our body doesn't actually know that when we're in fight or flight. Our body literally thinks that we're in danger. So it's never a good place to continue moving forward and negotiating your salary when you're in that state. So you want to breathe. You want to breathe in when you get yourself back into a regulated state. Number two, you want to really consider if they already hit the target of your minimum salary, you want to consider and they denied any of the other things that you asked for. You want to ask, like, are there any parts that are negotiable of this compensation package? And then decide from there, is there something you want to negotiate? Because you get to decide. Am I okay with what they offered? I negotiated and they said, no, that doesn't mean you can't accept the offer. Just means you tried and they said no, and there's not any room for it. So ask, is there anything else that can be negotiated? If there isn't, and they met your minimum target, do you want to work for them? Do you want to work with them? Some of you will make it mean that they don't value you. And I just want to offer that. It's not true. They chose you for a reason and they're giving you the salary that you asked for. It just means that they're not going to budge on these other things. Again, so many nuances to it. Negotiate the alternatives. So always look, what are the other perks and how can I negotiate them? And then the last one is know when to walk away. If they did not meet your minimum and you negotiated and they said no, you've got to know when to walk away. Because trust me, if you take the job at a lower salary, you're going to feel bitter down the line. It's only going to be a matter of time before that stuff eats you up and you're bitter that you're not making the amount of money that you wanted to make because you decided on that number and then you went back on your decision. So know when to walk away. And if you're going to receive, if you're going to accept the offer at the lower amount, fully accept it. It's like one of those things like in relationships when you forgive someone, but then you bring it up all the time. It's like, that's not how it works. Are you going to accept that job offer and say, I love this place. I love the potential of what my career could be in this place. I'm going to accept this job and go for it. So remember, there's so many different parts to this, but know when to walk away is a really big one, um, especially if you are maybe unemployed. I, I know this is really hard when if you're unemployed because you're like, I just need something. So just understand where you're at right there. And that's where I am when you talk about going from regulating yourself, look, asking about the options, negotiate your alternatives, and then know when to walk away. Know when it's time to just be like, okay, this isn't the right offer for me. I'm sorry, but I'm actually going to be moving on. And what I really want to say in this part is it's so important that you are having very clear communication because a lot of people get um, really afraid about negotiating their salary, but if you have clear communications, if you have clear intentions, if you've been um, promptly communicating with the potential employer or your current employer, you're going to be okay. That's not something that they can hold against you. Not to say that people won't hold it against you, but you have done nothing wrong. When things get really messy is when people don't clearly communicate. When people ask for a certain salary, they're given that salary and then they negotiate for 15K more. That's where things get like, what do you mean? We just gave you what you wanted. Or where people then become like, they ask for a laundry list of things that never came up earlier in the conversation. That's just think about it, how you would want to be treated and think like the employer. When you think like the employer, you're able to tap into a much better solutions oriented mindset because you're not so focused on like what you want and what you need. Not to say that doesn't matter because you've already done that work. You focused on what you want and what you need, but you want to think like the employer. That's a mindset hack. You want to think like the employer, like 
why wouldn't they want to give me more money if I could potentially not receive this offer? What would they want to see in me in order to be like that 100%? It's worth the 5K. It's worth the extra 5K. Let's do that. What are their challenges? If the HR is like, I'm so sorry, I can't negotiate on this. How can you really empathize with the HR manager who maybe does want to offer you more money, but can't? How do you see where else is their wiggle room? The more that you listen to understand and the more that you listen to truly understand the employer side of it, the better you will be because you will then be able to manage yourself and also pitch yourself in the way that they want to be pitched in the way that they want to like have help and receive help. Okay. So that is the whole thing. The last thing I really want to say, if you are feeling stuck in your career, if you're feeling confused about what path is right for you, uh, I don't know about you, but I literally didn't declare my major until like the second semester of my sophomore year when I think I had to, it was like no longer something I could put off. I also stumbled a lot after graduating from college. So if right now you're feeling stuck and you're confused and you're like, what career path is right for me? I don't know. I'm not even using my major, all these different things. I want you to know that this is something that I specifically help my clients with is just understanding what is it that you love to do? How does that look like in a career? What are your values and your strengths? And what do you bring to the table in order to be able to create a career path that is aligned for you and also make more money? Because it doesn't mean you have to start all over. This is where my area of expertise is. I am going to drop in the chat where you can book a free consult. And a free consult is literally where we get together, we get on Zoom, we talk about what's keeping you stuck, identify what your biggest challenges are, clarify your career goals. And from there, I'm wearing my coaching hat. So I'm really just here to listen to what's going on with you and what would be the next steps. If it sounds like it could be something I can help you with, then we'll talk about what that looks like and how I can help you and what I offer. So I'm going to drop in the chat how you can book a consult, where you can check me out, and you're more than welcome to connect with me. And I know Megan's going to announce some winners, and then I'll do Q&A to see if anyone has specific questions about their situation or what they're concerned about coming up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alejandra. I learned a lot and I hope everybody else did as well. You might have seen, well, I hope you didn't see because she was spotlighted, but my eyes going back and forth to my screen to <laughs> announce some winners. And so as you know, this is, or I hope you know, this is part of our Young Alumni Conference lead up. So that conference is happening Friday, September 23rd on campus. And it's the first time that the Alumni Association is leading a conference specifically for young alumni to talk about things like salary negotiation, to talk about things like what it means to pivot your career, what does it mean to go back to grad school, things like this. Uh, so without further ado, I have three people. If you could just hang on or direct message me your emails, um, I will follow up with how I get free registrations for the conference. Our winners were Aman Ali. If I'm mess if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, if you're still on, just message me your email. SW, you could message me your mm. email and your name. And then Erin awesome. Fitzpatrick. And if you are not in the area, um, just message me that too. And I have some backup winners. But from here, I'll let you put questions in the chat and let Alejandro take it from here. Lovely. Yes. So please, you can put questions in the chat. If you want to get off mute, you're more than welcome to get off mute. This is great. If you have a specific question about what you're experiencing, what you want to do, I'm happy to answer those while we're here together. And there's very likely something you have a question about that maybe someone else has a question about. Malcolm. Oh, okay. Moya, sorry about that. There you go. Hi, Alejandra. My name is Moya. And my question is, if my minimum salary is 70000 mm -hmm. should I even apply to jobs where they post their salary as 70000 or 65 to 70, for example? I think 65 to 70 is definitely fine um, because you're still reaching that that threshold that they have, I would just be careful of how far off you are. And so if they are posting it, let's say it was something like 55 to 60, 
I would probably navigate out of that. If the job is something you really want because of, you know, maybe the company it's at or things like that, I would approach it more in the networking space and maybe have some informational interviews and be like, oh, how is it like in the company? And then, you know, but I really love this company. I think my salary requirement is just a little bit higher, but I'm wondering, do you think there's any wiggle room for that? If I were to decide to apply that way, again, you have now Intel, um, but now you get to talk to people and see like, maybe it's worth it from there, but I wouldn't apply if you don't do that aspect and someone does like 50 to 55 because then it's a big stretch and then it becomes a like well we posted this we already like said what the maximum was going to be thank you very helpful and just pointing out i interviewed for a job with a company that i really appreciate their mission mm -hmm. but the um salary was lower than what i'm looking for but, uh, and I haven't heard back, but just the, your suggestion about an opportunity to network, mm -hmm. I leaned into that conversation with them, that interview with them as a conversation and an opportunity to network. So I'm going to follow up, certainly ask if they've made a decision, but yeah. either way, just wanting to stay connected with them in whatever way I can. So yeah. um, help me on both fronts. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome, Boya. And best of luck with that. At the very least, yeah, like being able to connect with people who are in that space and share a mission. You know, they're working at that company. Some of them are probably working there because they also value that mission. So that's really great. Okay, we have a question from Alexa. Is negotiating during a performance review any different? For negotiating in a performance review, one of the biggest things when I, I'll just briefly go over like the six month game plan, what you want to do is you actually want to call a meeting with your manager and you want to talk about, hey, this, you know, this is what I've been up to. This is what I'm doing. I see my future here with this company. And I would actually love to be able to get on this track of how to get here and whatever that here is, what that role is for that promotion. What would you want to see in me? What do you think are the kind of problems I would need to solve? Solve? What are the kind of skills that I would get to develop in order to be able to reach something like that? And so, and, and you want to be also clear about like, I would love to be able to start that path and, you know, report to you on my progress and report to you like six months from now, what it looks like for me to be in this role. So what you're doing is you're setting the expectation again, clear as kind, you're setting the expectation. And now this manager un is understanding and knows that that's what you're targeting. So that would be one of the big differences is you're already in it. So what you want to do is have the conversation about, hey, this is where I'm planning to go. And then after you get the feedback from your manager, and you really want to make sure that you uh, get very clear feedback from your manager. Some managers are really struggle with managing and they struggle with actually giving clear feedback. So if they're just like, oh, we'd love to see uh, you be more of a go-getter. It's like, that's not really helping you, Alexa. Like you, you got to know, like this person said, we would love for you to be handling five accounts as opposed to two. And that way you're like, hey, I've been handling five accounts. So get clarity on your feedback. And then you would give uh, regular updates, meaning I would say at least bi-weekly to your manager and be like, hey, I've been working on this and this and this. I've been developing this skill. I just did this LinkedIn learning video. You know, you really start giving them the updates about what you're up to, what you're doing. And then three months after that, you would have another meeting and you would give like, that would be like a proper in-person like uh, or virtually whatever one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom where you tell them all the updates you've done over the past three months. And then you would be like, am I on track based on that conversation we had uh, you know, three months ago? Am I on track for three months from now to have another conversation on what it looks like to fulfill that role? And then you would know, oh, okay, you know, you, you actually we want this or actually we want that. And so that's what I mean about the game plan because what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna have vague feedback and then do all of that work for six months. And they're like, well, that's not what we really meant. You know, you wanna be able to have very clear feedback and update them along the way so that you always have receipts. You always have like, no, nah, remember we talked about this and this is what I'm doing. You always want to have receipts. That's what I would say is the biggest difference. Um, and you do have that also connection for some people. It's not so great because they don't have a great relationship with their manager or for other people. It is great because they have a good relationship and it's a really great way for you to showcase your leadership capabilities as well. We also have a hand from Lydia Parker. Lydia, hey, Lydia. Ask your question. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, sorry if you already addressed this. I had to join a bit late, but my question for you is how do you feel about when you're considering making a career jump and with that jump includes a salary jump that might be, you know, 10 to $20,000 different and in 
application process, you know, a lot of employers will ask what your current salary is. Um, how do you feel about it? You know, how we answer that question as applicants when it's going to be probably a big jump from what you're making now versus what you would like to make at that next job? That's such a good question, Lydia. Thank you. One, I would say, is it mandatory? Like, do you have to answer that question? Does it have a little red asterisk on it? Good question. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. When it's no, don't answer. That's not, you're not going to answer that question. I'm not a fan of that being on applications. I mentioned at the beginning of this call, I think uh, Gen Z, I think the early, the people coming into their career paths are really changing the game for what it looks like um, in terms of salary expectations, salary transparency, and things like that. I really don't like that question because I think uh, it pigeonholes people. And especially right now, we're seeing a lot of movement in the corporate world and just the workplace in general. So I would not answer the question when it is not mandatory. If you do answer the question and it's something like you just need to fill something in, I would fill in something like, uh, I would love to learn more about this role and discuss my skill sets and my capabilities before I share things on a salary. And if they're going to eliminate you based on that, it's one of those things, again, like understanding your risk aversion, how desperate you want a job. If you're not in the place where you're like, I need something, then, you know, just put that. And if they're not willing to um, move forward with that, then I would say it kind of has some red flags in terms of the company. And if they are willing to move forward, then great. You can have that conversation later on. Generally speaking, when you're moving up like that, I'm, I'm actually just, even if you're not jumping up a lot, I'm not a big fan of sharing your salary history at all. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. The last thing I'll say about that is like, we're human beings and we're biased. Like it, we can't, no matter how we slice it, we have bias. And the more that we can recognize that, the more, you know, we can really begin to have more equity in our hiring practices. So even if someone has a good heart and all these different things, looking, those things will make an impact subconsciously and sometimes consciously. So that's why I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, also another reason why I'm not a big fan of like photos on your resume. Okay. All right. Let's, Looks like we have one time for one more question. Is that okay, Alondra? Yeah, let's go. Great. So we have Marie asking, would you recommend negotiating during a performance review if your department head or supervisors insist that your company salary review board is never wrong? Um, I need a little bit more context on that, Marie. So if they're saying, like, if you already, you're basically, this is what I'm understanding, Maria. So let me know if I'm correct. You are want to negotiate your salary, but you're feeling unsure if you want to negotiate your salary because the person's like, well, whatever we gave you is correct. And that is the thing. So there's no reason to negotiate. Is that what's happening? You could just drop in a yes or. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So you're, yeah, you're kind of um, hitting the mark there. So at my organization, we have like annual performance and salary reviews. And after a salary appraisal, we have the opportunity to renegotiate. But my supervisor and like the head of our department insists that like there's no point in like renegotiating because the salary review board is typically never wrong about the salary appraisals. Um, so my question is like in that case, after receiving a salary appraisal, would you recommend like renegotiating? Yeah, Marie, what I'd say is there's a couple of red flags because one, it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, you can like go out if you want, but like, don't because we don't really change it. So I just think there might be a culture thing. There's a culture thing where, you know, they're technically by paper, you can negotiate your salary, but it sounds like what they're saying is it's a waste of time because we're not going to change it. So what I would recommend for you, again, depending on your risk aversion and how much you love the job and all those different things, I would still go for the negotiation if it is something that on paper, like it's, yeah, hey, you can negotiate your salary after this. I would go for it because, hey, at the end of the day, you get practice in negotiating your salary and that's going to really help you. Just you want to work on your mindset about what it means if they say no. Because if you start to get really unengaged, then it's going to be time to look for another job because they said no. So if you look into this and you're like, 
I want to negotiate my salary. I want to get practice in the worst that they can say is no. If they say no, I completely understand. And I still want to be in this job. Then I say, go for it because you get the practice. Um, but just be weary of a culture like that, because if they're doing that with this, they can do that with other things like PTO. Like we have a limited PTO, but no one takes PTO because the culture is of overwork. So you want to just pay attention to those things, red flags in the early parts of your career. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Best of luck. Unfortunately, we are at time. I know there are a few more questions in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording, but maybe if y'all want to stay after. Um, but again, thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it and hope that we see you at the Young Alumni Conference, uh, which is Friday, September 23rd. It is on our website, alumni.umd.edu. So please check that out and we will see you next time. Thank you.